Now Dostoevsky criticized utopianism And it's, it's brilliant, his, his formulation, so I'm going to read it to you In short, one may say anything about the history of the world Anything that might enter the most disordered imagination The only thing one can't say is that it's rational The very word sticks in one's throat And indeed, this is the odd thing that is continually happening There are continually turning up in life moral and rational persons Sages and lovers of humanity Who make it their object to live all their lives as morally and rationally as possible To be, so to speak, a light to their neighbors Simply in order to show them that it is possible to live morally and rationally in this world And yet we all know that these very people, sooner or later, have been false to themselves Playing some queer trick, often a most unseemly one Now I ask you What can be expected of man, since he is a being endowed with such strange qualities? Shower upon him every earthly blessing Drown him in a sea of happiness So that nothing but bubbles of bliss can be seen on the surface Give him economic prosperity, such that he should have nothing else to do but sleep Eat cakes And busy himself with the continuation of his species And even then, out of sheer ingratitude Sheer spite Man would play you some nasty trick He would even risk his cakes And would deliberately desire the most fatal rubbish The most uneconomical absurdity Simply to introduce into all this positive good sense His fatal fantastic element It's just his fantastic dreams, his vulgar folly that he will desire to retain Simply in order to prove to himself As though that were so necessary That men still are men, and not the keys of a piano Which the laws of nature threaten to control completely, so completely That one will be able to desire nothing but by the calendar So clearly that's Dostoevsky's criticism of materialistic determinism right? Which he felt as a Spiritual threat, fundamentally, its proposition being that Animals and human beings were deterministic machines It's a Newtonian worldview And that because of that, everything could be calculated and planned Ahead of time, because it could be predicted and measured And that is not all Even if man really were nothing but a piano key Even if this were proved to him by natural science and mathematics Even then he would not become reasonable But would purposely do something perverse Out of simple ingratitude, simply to gain his point And if he does not find means, he will contrive destruction and chaos Sufferings of all sort, only to gain his point He'll launch a curse upon the world And as only man can curse It's his privilege, and the primary distinction between him and other animals Maybe by his curse alone he will attain his object And convince himself that he's a man, and not a piano key If you say that all this, too, can be calculated and tabulated Chaos and darkness and curses So that the mere possibility of calculating it all beforehand Would stop it all And reason would reassert itself Then man would purposely go mad in order to be rid of reason and gain his point I believe in it, I answer for it For the whole work of man really seems to consist in nothing But proving to himself every minute That he's a man and not a piano key It may be at the cost of his skin It might be by cannibalism And this being so, can one help being tempted to rejoice that it has not yet come off And that desire still depends on something we don't know You will scream at me, that is, if you condescend to do so That no one's touching my free will That all they're concerned with is that my will should of, should of itself, of its own free will Coincide with my own normal interests, with the laws of nature and arithmetic Good heavens, gentlemen, what sort of free will is left when we come to tabulation and arithmetic When it will all be a case of twice two makes four Twice two makes four without my will As if free will meant that So what's his point? Well, it's sort of a Garden of Eden point You know, what are people like? Imagine you could reconstruct a paradise on earth You know, hypothetically, that's what everyone wants We could go live in the paradise, and that would be the end of the problem We'd all live happily ever after But in the original paradise story, that's what people were provided with And the first thing they did when they were put there Was to do the one thing that they were told not to do That would bring it all crashing down And that was immediately what they did And so Dostoevsky's story is actually a retelling of that idea The idea was that, that people aren't like the utopians think 
We don't want it easy. We don't want it comfortable. We don't want it good. And the reason for that is we'd be bored stiff. And so that if anybody ever did put us in the kind of nursery that would require us never to exert any effort to do anything at all whatsoever ever again, even if it meant going insane, we'd destroy it. And then he takes that further. He says, and that's a good thing. Kierkegaard, writing earlier, about 40 years earlier, said something quite similar. It is now about four years ago that I got the notion of wanting to try my luck as an author. I remember it quite clearly. It was on a Sunday. Yes, that's it, a Sunday afternoon. I was seated as usual, out of doors at the cafe in the Fredericksburg Garden. <laughs>been a student for half a score of years. Although never lazy, all my activity nevertheless was like a glittering inactivity, a kind of occupation for which I still have a great partiality, and for which perhaps I even have a little genius. I read much, spent the remainder of the day idling and thinking, or thinking and idling, but that was all it came to. So there I sat and smoked my cigar until I lapsed into thought. Among other thoughts, I remember these. You were going on... I said to myself, to become an old man, without being anything, and really, without undertaking to do anything. On the other hand, wherever you look about you in literature and in life, you see the celebrated names and figures, the precious and much heralded men who are coming into prominence, and are much talked about, the many benefactors of the age who know how to benefit mankind by making life easier and easier, some by railways, others by omnibuses and steamboats, others by the telegraph, Others by easily apprehended compendiums and short recitals of everything worth knowing. And finally, the true benefactors of the age who make spiritual existence, in virtue of thought, easier and easier, yet more and more significant. And what are you doing? Here my soliloquy was interrupted. For my cigar was smoked out and a new one had to be lit. So I smoked again, and then suddenly this thought flashed through my mind. You must do something. But inasmuch as with your limited capacities it will be impossible to make anything easier than it has become, you must, with the same humanity... enthusiasm as the others undertake to make something harder this notion pleased me immensely and at the same time it flattered me to think that I like the rest of them would be loved and esteemed by the whole community for when all combine in every way to make everything easier there remains only one possible danger namely that the ease becomes so great that it becomes altogether too great and then there's only one want left though it is not yet a felt want when people will want difficulty out of love for mankind and out of despair at my embarrassing situation seeing that I had accomplished nothing and was unable to make anything easier than it had already been made and moved by a genuine interest in those who make everything easy I conceived it as my task to create difficulties everywhere